Good morning, family. It's a great privilege and blessing to be with you this morning in this platform. And before we do anything, let us open up with a word of prayer. Our Father, thank you for the gift of your word. And thank you, our Father, for the opportunity of being able to spend time in your word. And Holy Spirit, I really pray that you will illuminate all of our hearts to what it is you want to share with us today. Holy Spirit, may you write it onto the tablet of our hearts and renew our minds according to the truth. And Holy Spirit, I pray now that you may hide, be, hide me behind the cross so that your people will not see or hear me, but that they will see and hear Christ Jesus speak through me into their very lives. So Holy Spirit, may your will be done and may we encounter Jesus in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So this morning, family, our theme that I believe the Holy Spirit has laid on my heart is the humility of a king leading us to serve. Now, in preparation for this morning's message as a lover of great cinema, I was captivated by a specific scene in Randall Wallace's action drama film based on Alexander Dumas's D'Artagnan romances, The Man in the Iron Mask. Now, for those of you who don't know, the film is a dramatization of the early reign of King Louis XIV of France. And long story short, within the movie, Louis is played by Leo DiCaprio, Leonardo DiCaprio. Louis, King Louis, is portrayed as an egocentric, power-hungry king who abuses and misuses members of his court. However, within the context of the film, some disgruntled musketeers uncover that King Louis XIV has an identical twin brother. And they then try to replace King Louis with his brother, Philippe. However, in the context of this film, such polarizing differences between Philippe and Louis are evidently clear. Louis is power-hungry and egotistic, and Philippe mild-mannered and kind. This is beautifully articulated in one scene where the musketeers switch King Louis for his brother Philippe. They dress him in Louis' clothing and Louis enters the throne room, he enters the court. And all members of court are dancing and whatever, and Philippe, now portray or now pretending to be Louis, walks up to the throne and sits down. And what happens is, is that within the dancing, one of the members of court falls on the throne or falls in front of the throne. And Philippe, because he is completely different to Louis, he's mild, he's kind, he steps off the throne to help the woman up. And all of the court goes, ah! because they realize that this is something that Louis wouldn't have done. Everyone knew the king, Louis, was egocentric. And what showed them this was someone different was the humility that Philippe brought to the fore. Now, I want you to hold on to this humility that distinguished Philippe from his brother as we unpack the scriptures for today. So this morning, I believe that the Holy Spirit has laid four short points for me to share with you this morning. And these are the first point, understanding our reliance. Number two, self-reliance ends up in serving gone wrong. Number three, the king who humbled himself. And lastly, his humility, empowering us for service. So our first point for this morning, understanding our reliance. Now in our Old Testament reading this morning, God prophesies through the prophet Jeremiah of Israel's unfaithfulness in keeping their covenant with Yahweh. Now in particular, I want to draw your attention to verse 6 of Jeremiah chapter 2, where God indicates that they did not ask where he was, him who brought them out of Egypt. Now Bible scholars suggest that this means that Israel as a nation had stopped seeking the Lord and de facto had forgot his sovereign power that he exerted to save them from Egypt. One Bible commentator suggests that Israel had forgotten who had saved and sustained them. Family, once the Israelites came into the promised land, they forgot who had sustained them and who made them being in the promised land, land a reality, and they forgot Yahweh. And instead, they embraced the idols of the surrounding nations. Don't forget, the Israelites were supposed to be a kingdom of priests to all nations, to show the nations how God's rule looks in practice, to live lives of radical difference to the pagans. But unfortunately, as they had turned away from Yahweh in relationship, they could not show the world 
what that would look like. Which is why Yahweh, through Jeremiah, said they had become worthless. But this is not just worthlessness as we would term it. This is worthlessness on a polluting level. I want to draw your attention to verse 13 where Yahweh says, His people have traded a spring of living water for broken cisterns which cannot hold water. Now to understand this context is key. Palestine, at the time of Jeremiah, you had three sources of attaining water. Firstly, you could attain fresh running water from a stream or a spring, which was the best source of water. Number two, you could get ground water from a well, you know, drawing it from the well. And lastly, you could also collect runoff water that was collected in a cistern. Now, a cistern was a pit hewn with limestone and plastered to prevent seepage. But unfortunately, these cisterns also collected salt and mosquito larvae. Now, let's try drinking that. I'm not a doctor, but I'm sure it's not going to end well. So not only have the Israelites forsaken the best in Yahweh for the worst, their cisterns are also broken with all its leaking, with all its water leaking out, with only sludge remaining. Now you see, family, the Israelites, they forgot their need of Yahweh. And in that, they lost the help of God because they chose instead to embrace idols of their own choosing. So what did they do? Israel embraced self. Family, how often in life do we not try and attempt to live life in our own strength, in our own wisdom, on our own resources. And more often than not, if we're honest, that leaves us in a worse off state than before, right? Because deep down, when we rely on self, we draw on our own reserves, we forget our need of God, and this was also foolishness on our part. Because instead of trusting in the almighty, all-knowing God for wisdom, significance, and acceptance, we now try to perform to solve our situations at hand or to even feel better about ourselves. Like the Israelites did, we draw on those broken cisterns. And there's a quote by Horatius Bonar, who was a Scottish churchman and poet, and he says, Self in all its forms is a hindrance to spiritual growth. I'm going to repeat that again. Self, in all its forms, is a hindrance to spiritual growth. No greater place is this emphasized in the word than in the actions of the religious leaders of Jesus' day. Which takes me to my second point. Self-reliance ends up in serving gone wrong. Now, in Jesus' day, the Pharisees and the religious leaders had emerged as the religious elite, setting the standard of piety and of true service. Or so it seemed to be. In verse 1 of our gospel reading for today, we find Jesus eating at the home of a prominent Pharisee. And with that, Jesus is being carefully watched. If you examine the Greek text, it says he's basically being scrutinized. Now the question we need to ask is why? You see, people of the cross, the Pharisees virtually carried on what the Israelites were being spoken against in Jeremiah The Pharisees did many acts of piety, such as giving to the poor. You can see this in Matthew chapter 6, verse 1 to 2. However, family, these were not gifts out of generosity because of what Yahweh had done for them. These were acts of piety or lifestyles of service to elevate and glorify themselves. Now, Jesus challenged them on this. And this is why they were watching carefully at what Jesus was doing. They were waiting to see if Jesus would measure up to their interpretation of Torah, if Jesus would adhere to what their acts of piety were supposed to be. And they were completely missing the fact that the true interpreter of the law was standing right in front of them. But with that being said, family, that challenged me profoundly as I prepared. Because as I meditated on this thought, I started to assess how often have I judged someone for what I perceive they should be doing in terms of service to God. You know, in relation to what I thought they should be doing. And family, I tell you the truth because I love you. But how often have we as believers 
projected what we think others should be doing in terms of service to God, and when they do not meet our lofty requirements, we become critical of them unnecessarily. Because family, the reality is we all fall short of God's glorious standard in terms of what we should be doing. That is a non-negotiable truth. So therefore, we cannot be the standard bearers of what true service looks like. Do you see? If we hold others to our standard, unwittingly we criticize, and then we too, from our cracked cisterns, pollute others with our criticism, which is exactly what the religious leaders of Jesus' day were doing to the Israelites. More so, it leads to confusion as to what is the standard of serving, because it then shifts from perspective to perspective, which results in confusion and sometimes horribly, disastrously, possible disillusionment with wanting to serve God at all. In Claire's beautiful message on Wednesday, it was really a beautiful message. She spoke on how Jesus rebuked the Pharisees for being whitewashed tombs, being beautifully outward, but rotting internally. And she also spoke on how they are like unmarked graves. And if you understand the Old Testament, if you stepped on an unmarked grave, you would be defiled. Therefore, Jesus was saying they defile people by what they do. So do you see how relying on self and serving from a vantage point of trying to raise yourself can be a terrifying way of polluting ourselves and thus those around us? But there is a way. There is a way for us to become truly servant-hearted, to serve God because of what He has done for us, which leads me to my third point, the King who humbled Himself. In verse 11 of our Gospel reading, Jesus gives one of the most profound quotes in all of Scripture. He who exalts Himself will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Jesus brings us this profound truth of humbling oneself. But in order to understand it, let's define what humility means. And there's a beautiful definition by the, the great Christian theologian C.S. Lewis, and he says, humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. I'm going to repeat that again. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. This is a quality that is exemplified in Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Because family, Jesus is Yahweh. He is God manifested in the flesh, the eternal Son of the Father, from everlasting to everlasting, God through whom all things were created, seen and unseen. But yet in His greatness, for our sake He humbled Himself, he became low. The king of all kings was born and laid in a feeding trough. Family, I think we forget sometimes the word that created all things became a baby and he had to have his nappy changed. He had to have his nappy changed. And as for Leap in the man with an iron in the iron mask, he gave a wonderful gesture of stepping down to help someone in his court from his throne. It was beautiful. But oh family, our Jesus did not just step down from his heavenly throne to help us, but he came down and he bled and died on the cross in our filth, on our behalf. Family, he was humbled lower than anyone ever was and ever will be. And that is why Jesus is exalted far above every name that ever was and ever will be. And family, as we see him bleeding, dying and rising again for us, as that truth melts our heart, that then becomes the power to empower us forward for true acts of service not out of glorifying self or trying to ascertain significance for ourselves, but because the priceless, worthy Son of God thought we were to die for. Because of the significance that it brings us, we want to serve others so that they can see Him in us. Do you see that massive shift? 
not out of trying to gain significance, but because we have worth and significance in Jesus, we can serve others with true freedom from heaven. And as in verses 7 to 10 of our gospel reading, we now don't clamor for places of honor anymore because we have been given incredible honor by and through Christ, becoming children of God. And we also perform acts of service to others in humility who cannot pay us back. To the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. And why? Because family, when Jesus saved us in many ways, we were blind. Blind to our sin. In many ways, we were lame. Lame, not able to walk forward because what have might been done to us. And some of us might have been paralyzed because of our sin, the sins of others. Not able to move forward, but he came and he saved us from that. So that we can take it to those who are. And this leads me to my fourth and final, final point is humility empowering us for service. The Holy Spirit now lives in us, believers, family, awakening us to the truth of Jesus and working it in us. And within each of us, Holy Spirit provides various giftings in order that we, the church, might be built up. And one such gifting is listed in 1 Corinthians 12, 27 of helping. It's a very humble, very humble service. And you know, in the course of being a youth pastor, one of the youth leaders, we were just sitting one day, chopping it up, chatting, setting up for a service. And as we were talking, I cautioned him because he was quite busy. I said, you know, you must be careful and you must make yourself a priority. You know, look after yourself. Um, you know, Jesus is still the head of the church. The church will carry on whether you can make it or not. And he said to me, Andrew, you know, just as I was spending time with Jesus, I believed my gift, my gifting is the gift of helping the church. So this youth leader takes great joy and he finds it a ministry to come and set up for a service, to come and do sound, to come and facilitate um, youth group meetings, to come and hang out and, and set up and lock up. He finds it as an act of service to Jesus for the kingdom. And why? Because of what Jesus is doing in him. He wants to bless others. And family, I tell you, the ministry of helping might look like insignificance, but it's not. Because have you ever tried to run a service without sound? <laughs> have you ever tried to run a youth gathering where someone's not helping you locking up? It's impossible and it's critical. Do you see how important it is to serve, but undergirded by love because of what Jesus has won for us? Family, where's the Holy Spirit prompting you to serve today? It does not have to be a massive, a thousand crowd event or a big paycheck. But because of his love, because of the humility displayed to us, we have a continuing debt to love one another and in doing so to serve Christ. Let us do that. Family, this morning the enemy might be lying to you by saying your gifting is too small or of no consequence. Family, that's not true. Tell him to shut up. Your gift that God has placed in you holds immeasurable worth because he has placed it in you to build up his body, to build all of us up. Whatever he has placed on your heart to do, whether it is in the workplace, whether it's here within his church body, do it for his glory as 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, because then what you do is holy, it's set apart. Everything you do becomes holy. Family, I invite you today, allow Jesus' love to melt your heart. See the significance you have in His sight. Allow that love to melt you to the point where you see that all you have is a gift of grace from Jesus. And may He then in you use those graces in love to serve Him by serving others. Augustine of Hippo, when I close with this quote, he says, What does love look like? It has the hands to help others. It has the feet to hasten to the poor and needy. It has eyes to see misery and want. It has ears to hear the sighs and sorrow of people. This is what love looks like. Family, let his humility, his love inspire you to serve him by serving others in both great and small ways. And who knows what he might do in you and through you as you do it. You are loved by the Father. So go and tell others that He loves them too in what you do. Amen.